one doesn't like to say it, but there is a Russian asset in the White House. That man, who certainly isn't pulling any punches, is journalist and author Craig Unger. He's worked for Vanity Fair and Esquire, but most recently, he's written a book called House of Trump, House of Putin. I got the chance to sit down with Craig to discuss the book where he lays out Trump's connection to Russian organized crime via money laundering rackets, the origins of the strategy Russia used to attack the U.S., and what the ordinary citizen like you and me can do to fight this. You call the cultivation of Donald Trump one of the greatest intelligence operations in history. You also say that he could maybe unwittingly be a Russian agent. Can you explain what that distinction is? Right. Well, this appears to be an operation that stretched over many decades, more than 35 years, and I think it began organically merely as money laundering and evolved into something else. And in 1984, Donald Trump met with a man named David Bogodin, who was tied to the Russian mafia. And Bogodin came in with $6 million, that's the equivalent of about $15 million, today and said, I'll have five condos. That, according to the State Attorney General's Office of New York, was laundering money. It was a transaction that was all cash and bought through anonymous shell companies. That kind of transaction happened again and again, and if it had only happened two or three times, I think you could make a strong case that we don't know what's going through his mind. But there's been investigations that found at least 1,300 similar transactions, all cash transactions in which anonymous shell companies are buying Trump real estate. That is probably billions of dollars. And, you know, there's a legal concept known as willful ignorance or, or deliberate ignorance. And I think a good case can be made that there's a real pattern here and that Trump was pretty much aware of going on in some level because it was so highly profitable. Can you explain, just at a basic level, what money laundering is? Money laundering is essentially is taking dirty money, often from organized crime or flight capital. And Russia has had roughly a trillion dollars in flight capital since uh, Vladimir Putin has been president. And entering it into the Western world, making it legitimate and washing it through banks. So real estate is a terrific way to launder lots of money. And the Russians figured that out, and so did Donald Trump. So why is real estate in particular so fantastic for this? Well, the, the regulations are incredibly lax. That is, it is legal to buy a condo here in Manhattan, all cash, uh, through a shell company, and no one will know that you own it. So you lay out the case that Donald Trump's ties to Russians started long before 2016. Right, and this is in the Russian Mafia, and I think an incredibly important thing to understand is that the Russian Mafia is very different from the Italian-American Mafia we're more familiar with here in the United States. And the big difference is the Russian Mafia are state actors. They are part of Russian intelligence. I interviewed General Oleg Kalugin, who'd been head of counterintelligence of the KGB, and when I asked him about the Russian Mafia, he said, oh, that's just another branch of the KGB. So so when you unpack what really was going on, that you had Russian mobsters buying into Trump Tower 35 years ago, that they continued to have a presence on and off, laundering vast amounts of money through Trump real estate, living in Trump Tower, the FBI searching and finding that uh, Russian mobsters lived there, and go all the way up to 2013, and you have a huge bust uh, of a gambling ring with Russian mobsters in Trump Tower. And when you understand that that these people are tied to Russian intelligence, that they have aligned straight into the Kremlin, and they're living in the home of the President of the United States, that is a massive security problem. So how much of this do you think is actual long-term strategy coming from Vladimir Putin himself, and how much of it is this has been an ongoing operation of Russian intelligence to try to destabilize the United States? Well, by 2013, you see things really start to kick in. And at that time, it was sort of interesting. The head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the Russian military, General Gerasimov, put out a paper that's sometimes known as the Gerasimov Doctrine. And, and he proposed a policy of hybrid warfare. At the time, he was saying that the Russian military is absolutely no match for the American military. Uh, and that's completely true, but he would say it really didn't matter because massive land invasions and old-fashioned wars generally don't yield very significant results. Look at what the United States did, ended up with in Vietnam. Right. Nothing. So he proposed a strategy of hybrid warfare that included cyber warfare, media manipulation. You see this massive assault on the truth, and it is right out of the Kremlin playbook. The kind of lies Trump tells again and again and again 
you know, you, you feel you have to respond to them, but when you do it, you're playing his game. You're being distracted by him. You're not going after your own agenda. Trump is wealthy. He was born wealthy. He inherited wealth. Why would somebody like that risk all of this to get involved in money laundering? Well, he's a very odd personality, but you see ties to organized crime going way, way back in the Trump family. His father, was, uh, who was a real estate developer in Queens and Brooklyn, had ties to the Russian mafia. When Trump himself started out, he also had ties to the mafia, and his lawyer was uh, Roy Cohn, who was the famous dark prince of the McCarthy era. And Roy Cohn was also a lawyer for the Italian-American mafia, which was just about to start partnering with the newly arrived Russian mafia. So I think in a way, this is where things started off with Trump getting involved with that. And that's been the source of uh, his whole fortune. They own him. He was $4 billion in debt after his Atlantic City when he overexpanded there. And they came to his aid with a completely different business plan for him. Now, one of the other criticisms of the Mueller investigation comes from people who say, oh, it's a McCarthyite type thing that's happening in America right now, and there's Russophobia occurring. But I think that you make a clear case that we're talking about Russian mafia actors and state actors. It's not just Russians in general but as the problem. This is about uh, an assault on American sovereignty. I, you know, I even find the word meddling uh, trivializes everything. Meddling is what your in-laws do with your marriage. You know, <laughs> this was an assault on America's sovereignty by tampering with our electoral system. Part of the challenge of this whole scandal is, is it breaks so many taboos. I mean, one doesn't like to say it, but there is a Russian asset in the White House. The Russians were able to install their man in the White House without firing a single shot. In many ways, I think this is a global conflict, and it's important to see it that way. We see the Russia doing the same kind of techniques all over Europe, and they fostered this this wave of right-wing anti-immigrant populism as a way of undermining European and Western unity. Putin wants to destroy the Western alliance, and he, he's done a pretty good job of it so far. I think it calls for a complete overhauling of our election rules, uh, like the Citizens United rule, right. the way super PACs are run. I think these investigations will be going on for several years. Right. What can the average person who is angry about this do about it? Vote. Uh, everyone has to vote, and our voter participation has been terrible, and it, it got much better for the midterms, but yeah. it was crucial. If the Democrats had lost the midterms, I think we would have faced another two years of Trump without uh, the Democrats having any weapon whatsoever to fight him back with. Uh, until the Democrats come back, Trump has effectively neutralized checks and balances, and what I look forward to is the Democrats getting back in power and fighting back because this uh, is not the kind of democracy I grew up in. That's it for this week's Russia Desk. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to share this video if you liked it. And do you have a story about Russia that you want us to cover? Let us know in the comments and we'll maybe make it into an episode. Thanks for watching guys, see you soon.